Obviously, in communications, there have been a lot of challenges and changes lately. Work from home has certainly become a thing. Technological innovations are coming out all the time, and it often feels like we're on the cusp of some kind of a massive sea change in the way that we do things, in the way that we communicate to audiences with one another, the way that we work, the way that we study, the way that we order food, all of this stuff. To talk about that today, I have Mr. Jonathan Blackwood. He is the editorial director of Commercial Integrator and the editor in chief of My Tech Decisions. Thank you for coming on the podcast, Mr. Blackwood. Thank you so much for having me. I'm excited to be here. And we're excited to have you. We'd like to thank Mr. Blackwood for joining us today, and we'd like to thank all of you for listening. This is Digital Signage Done Right. Whether you're new to digital signage or a seasoned pro, this podcast gives you practical advice about systems, communications, and content to better engage your audience. I'm Derek DeWitt, Communications Specialist for Physics. Welcome to Digital Signage Done Right. So, uh, Jonathan, the first thing that comes to mind is the most obvious one, I think, when I'm, we're thinking about uh, what are the 2020s and beyond going to look like in the technological and communications world, is the whole work from home trend, which obviously because of uh, lockdowns and things like this uh, sort of got forced on a lot of organizations, but I think it's going to have long-term effects even after things, quote unquote, go back to normal, like the new normal is going to be different than the old normal. Is that fair to say? Yeah, I think that's very fair to say. So how do you think that's going to uh, unfold? So I I think there's a few ways that people need to look at it. I I think that especially in, you know, the realm that we work, communications, technology, corporate environments, that we tend to forget that there's a large portion of the workforce that simply cannot work from home. So I think that a rhetoric gets pushed out there that, you know, part-time remote work is the new normal without Mm. remembering that there are a significant number of people that need to be on location in order to do their job. So I just want to sort of throw that caveat out there uh, before we go into the conversation, right? Because you'll get pushback from a lot of people that say, you know, well, I'm a machinist versus, you know, the typical quote unquote cube farm or open office space that remote work really works a a lot better for. Now, talent is going to drive that. So Mm -hmm. when talent appreciates that kind of flexibility, organizations need to cater to that talent and that'll keep trickling down because organizations will need to compete with other organizations and flexibility is going to be a a big part of that, I think. Organizations that are more agile in a changing landscape will be more successful. Yeah, without a doubt. And I think that, you know, I I think that's been shown over the years that there's a reason that companies tout when they're one of the voted one of the best places to work and, and things like that, because the growing rhetoric among millennials, if you look at the statistics, is that monetary compensation is becoming less and less valuable, although it, of course, is valuable to the workforce. And things like work-life balance are becoming more and more valuable as as time goes on. Yeah, I think I saw some study, it might have been late 2019, that said millennials will leave a job for a lower paying job or even a lower position than they had at their previous job if the work-life balance is better or if the benefits are uh, seen as more uh, valuable. Yeah, without a doubt. I think that, you know, going all the way back to Cats in the Cradle, I think that the millennial (laughs) generation has sort of heeded some of the warnings that they've learned from past generations about, you know, giving your life totally over to your work and and not creating that balance. And I I think it's really heated. I think on top of that, the growth in technology has brought cost of living for some what might have been considered luxury items in the past has come way down. So a given millennial can have a very comfortable high tech life without making, you know, absorbent amounts of money or, or without needing that. Right, exactly. Things get smaller, things get cheaper. Where I mean, you know, I, I joke all the time that we're all walking around with computers in our pockets that are more powerful than those that put the Apollo astronauts on the moon. 
cameras that are better than film cameras were in the 1970s and audio recording technology that is as good as anything when I was a young man that was available professionally. Yeah, a hundred percent. And and add on to that things like Amazon and, and Airbnb where you can rent mm. a vacation home for a week and you don't need to buy it separately. And you know, some of those lavish lifestyle choices are for rent now where I think in the past it was, you know, you needed to make a certain income to be able to afford you know, bringing it back to corporate environments and bringing it back to the workplace, the technology similarly has opened up new possibilities for people. So organizations can have a further reach to find talent and employees can have more flexibility as, as we're seeing now to, if they're working in the city, to move further out into the suburbs where things may be more affordable and only mm. have to commute one or two days a week. So that commute time isn't as much of a hassle as it might have been in, in the past. Yeah, that's true. If you add another 30 minutes to your commute and you're doing that every day, that's a lot of time at the end of a year. But if you're only going in once or twice a week, it's not that big a, a hassle. Exactly. And flex hours on top of that, maybe you don't have to go in until 11 o'clock. So you miss the morning traffic rush and maybe mm-hmm. you can leave early or you end up staying late. I, I think organizations have, have become a lot more accepting of, of some things. And I, I think that old school rhetoric is going out the window where even corporate leaders are now understanding that they can work from home a few days a week and still get as much done and still have just as much control over their employees and, and engagement with their employees as they had beforehand. Because technology technology has just enabled people to be closer even when they're distant. And on top of that, not just millennials, you know, the the joke is always, you know, how you have some of the maybe um, older people in your workforce aren't as great with technology. But I, I think at this point, I think the majority of people in the workforce has pretty good familiarity with technology. And I think the past mm. year, what I've really been, been seeing is that the employee that once had to call the IT pro into the conference room just to figure out which cords to plug in, that same employee after the past year can now connect to a VPN remotely and start a Zoom meeting and record it and uh, set up their own individual web camera and audio device. Mm. And they're much more technologically literate from how they've had to work. And, you know, that rise in Zoom conferences and things like that, that people were even doing with family in the early days of COVID when, you know, things were much less understood and, and a lot of things were locked down. Yeah, it's exactly. It's the opposite of the old saw that uh, familiarity breeds contempt, maybe eventually, but it certainly in the beginning stages breeds um, competence. Yeah, yeah, without a doubt. And I think that that's really what a lot of organizations were most worried about leading into COVID-19 was simply that their workforce wasn't going to be able to understand the nuances of using the technology to work. But I think that, you know, the studies coming in have shown that specifically for individual work, working from home has has had no impact on productivity or a positive impact on productivity. But there's been very few studies that I've seen that have found negative impacts for individual work. And, and I think that will lead into the collaborative work happening in the workplace and individual work happening at home. Yeah, I think that's absolutely so. I wonder if this is going to change sort of the physical infrastructure of work environments, university environments, and so on. Like some things obviously are always going to have people physically present, manufacturing facilities, warehouses, things like this. They're not really going to change. But, you know, I keep reading a lot of articles and opinion pieces saying that, you know, it might be possible for Corporation A to scale down the size of their office space because they literally don't need it. You're not going to have 150 people in there on any one day ever again. So why pay the rent? Why pay the electricity? If I was a business owner, I would certainly be thinking about downsizing because obviously that cuts down on operating costs. But the first Mm. thing I would be thinking about is reaching out to my workforce and surveying them on their preferences because obviously there are a certain amount of employees that are going to prefer working in the office or at least prefer working in the office part-time. So I would seek to try to understand the best that I can of my employees, what they want to do within the office, why they want to work home, when they want to work home, uh, what their preferences are for staggered schedules and things like that and really understand what's going to work for my workforce before I start changing the way that or or moving offices or anything like that. 
Now, I do think um, that what they'll end up finding is that the majority of employees that want some sort of hybrid schedule where they're working from home part time and working in the office part time, uh, the in office would be for collaborative work at home would be for individual work. And you'd want to cater Mm. your office towards that. So maybe that means, you know, taking some of those cubicles and working that space into new meeting spaces and outfitting those new meeting spaces with the kind of technology that enables some people being outside of the office, some people being inside of the office and still able to collaborate and and present to one another as effectively as if they were all together. Sure. So when we're talking about business agility, we're not just talking about it in abstract ways or in, in strategic planning ways. We're talking about potentially even having a physical space that can be reconfigured to a certain extent, depending on how many people are going to be physically present on any given day. Yeah, 100%. We've just gone through the largest experiment in the workforce in, what I believe, the history of the United States and, and the world, really. Once upon a time, people were working you know, 12-hour shifts, seven days a week, and people had to fight and protest and form unions to cut down on that. This time right. around... Get a, get a of, weekend. <laughs> yeah, exactly. This time around, I, I think that remote work, or at least part-time remote work, is the natural progression of where um, corporate work has been heading anyway. And obviously, Mm. you know, there were plenty of companies and there were plenty of people who were working remotely, even full time prior to COVID. What COVID did was put us all in it together and give us a ton of data at one point to show us that, you know, productivity isn't dropping only for certain responsibilities like collaboration and, and teamwork. Is there even any negative impact from working from home? Right. Well, it seems like not. I saw an article just the other day that said people actually tend to work more when they're working at home because it's not so cleanly delineated home life, work life. And so, you know, or they feel guilty, like whatever the dog needed to go for a walk. So I'll just tack that onto the end of my work day. And pretty soon people are working till seven, seven thirty. There's no way I'm staying in the office till seven thirty. Isn't that the work life balance where you can build your life and work together so that, you know, if you force people to work eight hours straight, there are naturally going to be lulls where mm-hmm. they're not able to focus for eight full hours. But but if you expand that to exactly what you're saying, uh, almost like a 12 hour work day where they can, you know, take an hour and a half to make themselves lunch and take the dog for a walk because they're going to make up that work in the evening time when maybe they catch their second wind. Why wouldn't you want that as, as an employer? It's, it's more difficult to measure. But I think that especially in this day and age with, with all the information that we have and, and all the data we can collect and the technology, I, I think that as an employer, it's much easier to understand on an individual level if someone is getting their work done. And, and that should be all that matters to you know a given employer, that, that they're getting their work done and that the people that are going above and beyond and you know taking on more responsibility that they're you know, picked out for potential promotion opportunities and things like that, Um, But also, you know, you're going to have a a certain section of the workforce that gets their work done and builds it into their life and and they're happy that way. And and employers should be happy with that, you know, type of employee as well. Yeah, I often think of it as sort of a distributed siesta, you know, like uh, in Spain, people have a tendency, they go to work fairly early and then they take from noon till three off. And, you know, it's called the siesta, but actually people don't sleep usually during it. They they go to a movie, they have a really long lunch, they take care of errands that they needed to take care of, they go to the museum, and then they go back to work around three, and they work till eight. And that's the Spanish style of living and working. And it's almost like we're taking that idea of, say, taking a three, three and a half hour break in the middle of the day and just kind of spreading it out. It's up to you to decide how you distribute your time. And I also wonder if this isn't going to get rid of, for white collar workers, if it's not going to get rid of the whole concept of hourly wages. Maybe everybody should just be on salary. This is the work that we need you to do. Here's the pay for that. You you figure out how to do it. Yeah, I, I think that's a, a great point as well. I think that that would make a lot of hourly employees happy. Uh, you know, maybe not a potential loss in overtime, but a lot of hourly employees don't have an overtime option anyway. Mm-hmm. And and I think that, you know, to your point, if I'm someone that has my greatest productivity between seven and nine o'clock at night, right? and you're making me work from eight to five, I'm not going to take that seven to nine to do work because I've already felt that that's going to be for my 
personal time and my most productive hours of the day are going to go towards hobby, you know what I mean, rather than go towards work. So as an employer, you know, you want to enable people to be working towards their goals in the workplace at their most productive times. And that's not the same for everybody. Yeah, that's true. I mean, me, I am not a morning person and I've had jobs where I have to physically be there at seven or eight o'clock in the morning. And I'm just like, I'm not at my best self here. I'm going to drink all your coffee, your terrible coffee. And I'm still going to, until I have lunch, I'm really not going to be like call it quarter speed. And then after lunch, okay. Like, cause like I'm one of those people that right around four o'clock in the afternoon, I start going, okay, now let's get some stuff done. Exactly. And that, and that gives you, you know, in the traditional uh, workflow that gives you maybe an hour where you're at your best during the right. work day. You know what I mean? So, you know, it's, it's a missed opportunity. And I think that COVID, you know, if you can look at any kind of bright side, I think that the the work from home sort of revolution is, is going to be something that we look back on and say, you know, we should have been thinking about this a lot earlier, but I also think that it's something that had it not been for COVID, it, it would have been just like, you know, coming from seven day work weeks down to five and coming down to eight hour days, 40 hour weeks, it would have been something that the uh, average employee had to fight for. And uh, right. in, in this case, it was just sort of a, a, a happenstance, a, a, a matter of circumstance. So it was one of those kind of perfect storms of this was already the trend. And then this situation develops that requires that trend to be implemented widespread against many of the bosses' uh, better thoughts on the topic. You know, the, a lot of bosses were very reticent to do this for a number of reasons. And I've always thought, eh, it's very old-fashioned thinking. I mean, honestly, you know, we're not making tires here. We're, we're writing website content. You know, <laughs> do I really have to write website content between nine and five? I mean, that's just as ridiculous, you know? So it all kind of is creating this almost collaboration between the C-suite and management and the employee on the ground. Yeah, a hundred percent. And and on top of that, it's like that old school way of thinking is is sort of built off of the idea that the average worker is going to try to waste as much time and do as little work as possible. You know what I mean? The the average employee does want to get their work done and they want mm -hmm. to get it done the best that they can. And and not everyone's going to go above and beyond. But again, you know, you're not paying them to go above and beyond. Those above and beyond people are the ones that you want to key in on and, and promote to leadership positions so that they can, you know, continue to do more for your company. But I, I think the reality isn't laziness. I think the reality is that there's a certain percentage of the workforce that's always going to be complacent with where they are. So they're going to get their work done. They may not go above and beyond, but you're, you're never going to get 100%, you know, go-getters because there's no. just not 100% go-getters in the population. Yeah. Because they're not a go-getter doesn't make them a, a lazy, you know, slack off, you know, and I right. think that that's where we're finding in the middle that, you know, especially with remote work, you're getting a lot more out of these people that really appreciate that work-life balance and don't need to worry about, okay, as soon as I get out of work, I need to go to the gym and then I need to go to the grocery store and I got to cook dinner and then I got to put the kids to bed. And by the time I have a second to myself, it's going to be 8.30, 9 o'clock and I'm going to be exhausted because I've been nonstop since, since 9 in the morning versus getting some of those right. things done earlier in the day. Obviously, that's the business world. Uh, white collar companies. What about education? Uh, especially I'm thinking universities. I think K-12 is always going to have, because K-12 very often is also sort of doubles, let's be honest, as a, a type of a daycare in addition to being an educative uh, facility for young people. But like university, I wonder if that's going to also change or if you'll find that students prefer being face-to-face -face and in the social sort of milieu of being with their friends and just the sort of that college experience? Or is all of this going to completely transform that experience? My opinion on the college front is that the students and the college itself is incentivized to get onto campus. The student to have that independent life that they have lacked mm -hmm. up until they were 18 years old. And, and as you said, to be around friends and to be on their own and to be independent. The college, because a lot of times... Tuition is one cost, but then room and board and, and living expensive is a much larger cost. And, and a lot of yeah. how they make money is to make sure that, that students are on campus. What I think will be different is 
the hybrid classroom. So I, I think that the last year and moving forward has really enabled colleges to bring some sort of online program into their uh, schools. So they'll continue to have, I believe, the same amount of students coming to the classroom, but they can expand their student base to cover online students as well. So they can bring in more tuition money without losing out on anything on the other end. And that's really going to be, I I think it's going to be less of an onus on professors and educators creating online courses and more of an onus on taking the courses they are doing in person with students and creating a hybrid approach where that is being recorded. uh, And that helps create an online component to that same organization. So in the same classroom, in the same semester, you have, you know, 75% of the students in the class or in the room, but you have another 25% that are online and learning everything the same way and participating in in very similar ways, but they may not have the money or or have the means to come onto campus and and to live on campus. They may have situations at home where they're taking care of people. So they need an online experience to help them get ahead just like everybody else, but they don't have the the means to do it in the traditional way. So I I think it's going to be much more of a hybrid approach, but I don't think there's many colleges that are saying, okay, let's knock down some dorms for more, um, (laughs) you know, for for, for more uh, educational facilities. You know, the key to everything that we're talking about is is that flexibility. I think that's ultimately what people want. I think they want to learn and they want to work. You know what I mean? But I think that boxing them into specific times or specific ways of doing it is not ideal. And I think that, you know, different people learn in different ways and different people Mm -hmm. work in different ways. And my mother is a teacher. My sister's a teacher. I have aunts and cousins that all teach. And uh, I I think the last 10 to 15 years, really the onus on different children learning in different ways has, Mm -hmm. has come to the forefront. And I think that technology will be an extension of that. One thing I do Mm. wonder for K through 12, because to your point, it is, it it does serve a secondary role of, you know, being a place where kids can be safe while their parents are working. I wonder if things like maybe school vacations or, or really like things like snow days will now turn into, you know, learn from home days so that those right. how it works now, at least in the United States is a snow day occurs and that day is then tacked on to the end of the year. So if you have five right. or six snow days, you originally were going to get out, you know, June 12th. Now you're going to get out on June 27th. Maybe that right. won't happen any longer, which is a shame for all the students of, of the future, if that's the case, because I, I loved my snow days. There was nothing like them. But what about other communication things like uh, obviously because I'm talking on behalf of physics who makes digital signage software, I'm thinking about something like digital signage, digital signage kind of sort of needs people to physically be there to see the messages on the screens or does it? I think digital signage is really going to be a large piece of the new workforce because if Mm. you think about it now, digital signage, there's so much more information that's going to be happening. Let's say you're an organization that switched to a staggered schedule. So, So I'm Jonathan Blackwood, and in week one, I come in Monday and Tuesday. In week two, I come in Tuesday and Thursday. In week three, I come in Wednesday and Friday. It's happening like that for everyone. Now, though, the digital signage that may have just been showing what's on the menu for lunch in the cafeteria or just a corporate logo or, or something like that, now it can be used to say, here's a list of the people that are in the office today. So even right. guests that are coming in can know, okay, John Smith is, is in today. I, I wanted to go and visit him. You know, employees that are coming in can take a look and say, okay, here's my schedule for the week because I'm still learning it and, and things like that. On top of that, in the short term with COVID um, and, and, you know, depending on, that's one thing I'm, I'm not 100% sure of is, you know, the hypochondria of the, of the masses that might occur <laughs> moving forward and, and is six feet going to stay even once, you know, people are vaccinated and COVID is back of mind, you know, are those sort of health and safety precautions that we've been taking going to stick around if they are, digital signage will be what is at the forefront of communicating those health and safety practices because they, they may be different from building to building. And a couple of things we also discussed, or I've discussed with um, some of our audience, and, and I'm also the editorial director of, of Commercial Integrator, the integration uh, audience is places like bathrooms and elevators that... Mm. If there's an occupancy limit, you need to step in there to find out what the occupancy is, unless there's digital signage letting you know, 
you know, two people are in the bathroom, it's at full capacity, the screen's red right now, someone comes out, okay, you can go back in. Or on the elevator, it lets you know beforehand, six people are on the elevator, please leave 12 feet of space for them to exit before you step onto the elevator. Things right. like that are going to be run by digital signage systems. Who knows what, what happens in the future? And I think that plans for health and safety for viruses and things like that are, are, are going to need to be worked in the same way that fire uh, plans for if there's yeah. a fire in the building or if, if right now in schools for emergency lockdowns and, and things like that. And again, that's all, you know, it's, it's audio systems are built into that as well, but digital mm -hmm. signage systems are a, a big part of that. In a, an emergency situation, it might tell you which stairwell to go to. In a virus mm -hmm. type of situation, it might tell you, you know, maintain this amount of distance between your coworkers, make sure to wear a mask. It might point you out to where sanitation stations are or point you out to where there are masks on the wall that you can pull out or, or things like that. So digital signage will be able to inform people on a much larger scale scale than you know your manager sending sending out an email plus of course it's it could the thing is you, you enter it in and you know if you're doing a, a web-based cms you can literally on your phone go access the you know the dashboard and and stick up a message immediately so it's actually more dynamic and more of the moment boom this is happening Let's go. I mean, this is what alert notifications are all about. Yeah, absolutely. And I think digital signage is absolutely perfect for that because it can it can disseminate information where people actually are. And you you can miss an email in your inbox because, you know, you're really busy that week. But it's tough to if you're waiting for the elevator and, and there's a TV screen there, it's tough to not be looking at the TV screen and, and looking what's on it or a display screen uh, there. It's tough to not check that out while you're waiting for a couple minutes or if you're, you know, yeah. walking through the hallways and there's a big bright sign that says important information about health and safety, you know, it's odds are you're going to stop for a second and read that versus, right. you know, in, in your inbox, you might only see important in four dot, dot, dot. Like there's some apps right now that allow for contact tracing. Hey, someone who uses this app, it's not a hundred percent because not everybody has the app, but someone who uses this app has reported to the app that they have COVID. And you, we see from your GPS data, were in the same place as they were two days ago. So you might want to go get tested. That's like a little warning. I, I wonder if we're going to see stuff like this in physical facilities. You know, John on the fifth floor just tested positive for COVID and let us know everybody needs to go get a test. Yeah, absolutely. I, I mean, the uh, NFL, when they first came back, were using wristbands that everyone, so it wasn't even an app. Really? It was a wristband that, yeah, you came in, you signed in, yeah, you signed your name, put the wristband on, and it, the wristbands tracked who you were near and everything for that exact same reason. And think hmm. about that, you know, going back to earlier in our conversation, uh, those employees that are on like manufacturing floors, it's so crucial that that there's not some kind of outbreak in those areas that I could absolutely see even moving forward, even if something like flu season is particularly bad that year, having them wear something like that and someone who catches the flu saying, okay, these people were in, in the same environment as that person who caught the flu, have them go get tested or have them stay out of work for a day or two and, and make sure that they're okay. It, it might not just be COVID. I, I think that general health and safety has improved so much. You, you've seen that cases of everything have gone down over the last year. And obviously mm. there's been much less, you know, people in the same area. As disgusting as it is, I think it's even as much as a significant portion of the a population that doesn't wash their hands, you know, a, a few times a day or is sick and comes into work anyway and just doesn't tell anybody and, and goes around and infects, you know, half the office with something. I think that back in the day, it was almost encouraged to come in, even if you were sick. And then for the next two weeks, half of half of your employees are sick and your productivity drops where I think in the future, it's right. going to be much more, you know, stay at home an extra few days to make sure that you're completely good to go and you're not going to infect anybody else. And you don't need to use any sick days and whatnot because we have this hybrid blended online work environment. And so you can actually continue to do many of the tasks that your job requires you to do from home. It, exactly. And I think a lot of those times it was people trying to conserve their sick days. Like if you have just the common cold, you, you yeah. want to hang on to those sick days in, in case something worse happens throughout the year. And now it's going to say, okay, you can still work, but we don't want you coming in here and potentially getting other people sick. So to your point, work from home this week. And, and it's as, as easy as that. It's, a, it's the snap of a finger. It's the flip of a switch and, and you're good to go. You're getting the same amount of productivity and you're not putting other people in the workplace at risk. 
So all this, this magical world, which is, by the way, this is not someday in the future. This is happening now, and it's going to become commonplace. I think by 2025, this will just be uh, very familiar to almost all of us and for people who are coming into the workforce in whatever capacity, in whatever sector, this is just going to be how things are done. What are some of the technologies that are going to enable this to happen? So there's in the office technology and there's out of the office technology that are going to enable all of this. Within the office, it's majority is meeting room technology. So mm. collaboration systems, touchscreen displays within the meeting room, video conferencing uh, systems within the meeting room that really allow for real-time manipulation of different content and sharing of different content. You'll need to be able to make sure that people within the room can easily communicate with people that are working from home and that they can manipulate the same content. Audio is going to be huge. And I know on the AV integration side, I think that in the past, video conferencing systems, when you have started talking about the audio side of things, they've said, you know, just give us something, you know, give us whatever. Like when everyone is video conferencing and you start to experience some terrible audio on, some, on one person's end, you realize how much that can disrupt the meeting. So I think audio and high quality audio is going to become a big part of that meeting room. On mm -hmm. the other end, at home, we asked how many of uh, the organizations uh, felt compelled to provide employees employees with work from home technology. 73% said that they felt required, but we also asked, huh. what are you providing for them? And the majority of it was what you would expect, the laptop, cables, uh, some said a secondary display. One of the things that was lowest on the list were modems and routers. So mm. I think that moving forward, companies may decide, okay, for certain employees, or even for all employees that work majority from home, we are going to create a package that we send them that's a laptop, a second display, uh, an individual webcam, an individual microphone, mm. and a modem and a router that are more high end than what you would get from the ISP. And it may even be like a renting type situation where, you know, if that employee ever leaves, of course, they need to send everything back to the company. Right. But employees sooner or later aren't going to feel compelled to put in that capital. They're going to mm -hmm. feel that their employers should be the ones to do so. So that's going to be a conversation that needs to happen between the workforce and between employers. But I think that it's a similar thing where certain employers are going to start doing it. Talent is going to gravitate towards those employers because they're doing it. And then competition is going to have to start bringing that practice this in as well, much like how remote work sort of was growing up until COVID. I, I think outfitting employees in their home and the home being an extension of the workplace and the organization feeling compelled to outfit that extension with the right technology will, mm -hmm. will continue to grow and in, in, in that manner. Right. And I can kind of imagine again, that old fashioned mindset of like, well, we don't want to supply them with all this stuff because, you know, they're also going to, we'll tell them not to, but they're going to use it in their personal lives as well. Well, is that really such a big deal? I mean, just consider it an extra perk. You know, back when we could travel, when I'm traveling, I take my work laptop with me. And, and at the end of the day, you know, before bed, I'll watch net Netflix on my work laptop. Like I'm using a little bit more battery and things like that. If, if I had an employer that said, do not do that. And obviously there are fintech and accounting firms, things like that. There's going to be sensitive information and you shouldn't be using that equipment because of mm. the cybersecurity risks. But sure. for something where it's just like an average day-to-day thing and there's no or not much proprietary information that people are trying to steal. I think that, you know, that's just the cost of doing business. And I mean, even within the office, people are going to go on ESPN and Yahoo and check their fantasy teams while they're on break and things like that. <laughs> yeah. So they're using it, whether they're in the office or not, they're using it for personal reasons. Yeah, it's the digital equivalent of free coffee and donuts. <laughs> exactly. It, it, it's a perk and it's something that that organization should, you know, feel fine about giving to their employees. What about software solutions like especially I'm thinking of uh, Teams and some of these other collaboration software uh, platforms that uh, allow people to use the web to communicate from, you know, wherever. This guy's in Tokyo, this gal's in Madrid, this person's in Mexico City, this person's in, you know, Saskatoon, and they can all 
collaborate in essentially real time, even though they're all in different time zones. Uh, we're going to see more of that kind of stuff. We're going to see more integration with that kind of stuff. You think we're going to see start seeing a lot of these things that are disparate apps right now, sort of combining or finding ways to integrate with these platforms. Like I know digital signage, for example, is starting to, some companies are starting to implement or transition to being able to be used with Teams and uh, Google Classroom and things like this by using HTML5 viewers and other software solutions to kind of help uh, integrate everything into one seamless whole. Yeah, I, I think you nailed it there. I think integration is, is going to be the name of the game. I, I think right now you'll see a lot of organizations that whether it's within the same country in different locations or globally at different locations, uh, one office may be a Teams environment, another office may mm. be a Google environment, so on and so forth. I think you're going to see a lot more from the top down standardization of that communication software to make sure that every employee, no matter where, where they are, is utilizing the same software and the same applications. And I think that's going to naturally gravitate towards the Microsofts and the and the Apples, you know, uh, of, of the world. I think that a lot of the smaller players are going to integrate with those environments so that, you know, they'll they'll utilize those standardized environments to get their platforms off the ground as well. And so I think there'll still be um, plenty of opportunity for innovation, but I do think on the highest level, many organizations will fall into one of, you know, a handful of buckets the same way that Amazon has sort of taken over online ordering, you know, mm -hmm. and, and mm -hmm. there's third parties that sell through Amazon. I, I right. think it's going to end up being very similar because at, at this point, Office 365 can just do so much more and has so many more resources to continue to grow and has so much more data from their customers to fix pain points and things like that, that, you know, how, how do you create a competitor to that unless you're already mm -hmm. a, a multi-billion dollar company, technology company, you know what I mean, that has the resources mm -hmm. to really go at it. So that'll be something that, you know, will be interesting to take a look on. But as far as, you know, the people most likely listening to this podcast are concerned, I think it's going to be a lot more standardization to mm -hmm. one of a handful of those, you know, collaboration and communication platform uh, across the right. entire company. It seems to me that one of the disconnects that's always been there, or certainly since I've been an adult and, and working, is that the, uh, the higher-ups, they don't use this technology. They don't use this stuff. You know, like, so I think there's still some companies where you're lucky if the CEO has mastered email, let alone social media, and yet, you know, he or she feels competent enough to tell you how you should be using social media. And you're like, but dude, you don't even use it yourself. So so I, how important do you think it is that these people also get on board and start utilizing this technology themselves? I, I think that that's partly happened in the past year. I, I think, as I mentioned earlier, I think a lot more of the C-suite is going to feel comfortable working from home part-time and that's going to force them to understand how to utilize uh, this, this software. But I think the most important thing Again, going back to, to something I said earlier is surveying the, the company at large, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. And finding out what even down to the lowest level and department by department, how people like to work and what their preferences are, and then trying to find the solution. You're never going to find something that works for absolutely everybody. But you, if, if you really kind of dig in and collect that data, you're going to find solutions that the majority of the workforce can utilize. And that's going to give you the least path of resistance. What, what I would advise is that the C-suite maybe doesn't listen to their contact at the software provider saying, this is all the things we can do. And this is how your employees are going to use it and this is how much their productivity is going to jump up without first checking with the employees. You know, the employees might say, we've looked into that software before. It, it doesn't do this and this. And because it right. doesn't do this and this, it, it's going to create a ton more work for us. If you don't know that going in, you know, some salesperson could, could, could potentially sell you anything and it's going to sound great until you've already implemented it. And, and at that point, it could be a multi-million dollar sunken cost. Yeah, that's true. Or, or you know, like uh, when all this stuff started in early 2020, 
people came kind of came up with their own ad hoc solutions and now they're comfortable with those and then here you come in saying okay we're going to standardize and this product x is the thing we're all going to use and you find whole departments going well that just took away some of our capabilities and screwed up our workflows and you're actually not helping us you're hurting us exactly and, and meanwhile product y can integrate that exact app that they've been using and does everything else that you want it's just from a different provider so it's like mm. if you just asked around if you just did surveys if, if you included your workforce as much as you can in the in that conversation you would have saved yourself a ton of time and hassle so it seems that paradoxically the very thing that kept us all apart is now enabling us all to come together in a more collaborative environment in a more integrated environment it's a very tech heavy environment for sure but a lot of the changes that are happening right now and we're going to see in the next few years will be welcomed by many, many people at all layers of the organization and in all sectors, from healthcare to business to higher education to manufacturing to warehouses to industries that haven't even been invented yet. <laughs> uh, a super interesting and stimulating conversation today. I'd like to thank my guest, Jonathan Blackwood, Editorial Director of Commercial Integrator and Editor-in-Chief of My Tech Decisions. Thank you very much for the talk today, sir. Thank you very much for, for having me. I really enjoyed it. Yeah, it's it's so interesting. It just makes me wish I was younger because, uh, or they need to get cracking on that life extension technology because I really want to see what the rest of this 21st century is going to be like. A hundred percent, but I think a lot of change over the next 10, 20 years is, is going to occur. And I think that, you know, that, that sci-fi future that everyone's been writing about and that we've been looking forward to, I, I think the next 20, 30 years are really going to be where we get a lot closer to it than, than we are right now. And everybody wants that flying car from Blade Runner. <laughs> <laughs> it's the truth. <laughs> All right. Thank you for talking to me today, sir. And thank you, everybody out there for listening to this episode of Digital Signage Done Right. Hey, want more free stuff? Then head to the resources section of physics.com for free masterclass guides, blogs, videos, and more to help you with your digital signs. Please share, subscribe, and leave a review of this episode and connect with us on social media. 